Welcome to Transformative Principle. I'm your host, Jethro Jones, and you can follow me on Twitter at Jethro Jones. Hey, guess what? I've got a book coming out. How exciting is that? It's called School X, and it's all about helping you as a principal be a designer of your school and not just a manager. So I hope you'll check it out. You can download the free chapter at schoolx.me. So just go to schoolx.me to download the first free chapter. And once you get it, hit reply to the email and tell me what you think. Looking forward to sharing that with you. That's schoolx.me. This episode is brought to you by John Cat Educational, a professional development publisher serving as the global leader in combining both research and practice in all materials. Find timely PD publications to support yourself and your faculty by visiting them online at us.johncatbookshop.com. Great instruction gets students engaged. TeachFX equips teachers with the instructional strategies and job-embedded feedback they need to get students engaged in virtual or in-person classes. Learn more about TeachFX and get a special offer at teachfx.com slash transformative principle. I am excited to be a media partner for the Conrad Challenge. The Conrad Challenge is this amazing educational experience that allows students to create real-world applications to solve problems that we are facing today. It's amazing. Check out more at conradchallenge.org. That's conradchallenge.org. Welcome to Transformative Principle. I am very excited to have Amy Valentine here on the program. Amy has been called a social rabble rouser, a turnaround strategist and fighter of the status quo in K-12 education. She has served as a teacher, school leader, and executive director. She's also the proud parent advocate for her son who has dysgraphia, a learning disability that affects written expression. And she is the leader of Future of Schools. So thank you so much, Amy, for being part of Transformative Principal. I'm excited to have you on the program today. Thank you for having me, Jethro. It's great to be here. I've attended a few of your workshops that you've done this summer, your Future of Schools workshops, where you've had some special guests, and those have been a really insightful opportunity for me to learn a lot about you and the work that you do. But if you could just give a summary of what Future of Schools is and and why people should pay attention to the work that you're doing. Absolutely. Future of School, we are, I'm going to try to summarize it in less than two minutes because it's something I could talk about for a long, long time. You know how it goes when you're passionate about the work. We are a national nonprofit, and we focus on increasing access that students and teachers have to technology and innovative practices, ultimately for for quality teaching and learning in their lives. And so it's a big pill to swallow. It's a big tall drink of water to do. And people have asked, oh, is this something that's new? Did you just start doing this since the pandemic hit? And I kind of laugh and say, no, we haven't. We, We named our... We've had our name. We've been working in this space for the last five years because our board and our supporters, we've known that change is coming. Change was inevitable for our K-12 schools. It was just a matter of how and when. And I don't think anyone thought that it would happen this quickly or this swiftly, which presents its own challenges, which I'm sure we'll talk about. But as an organization, Future of Schools, gives we give scholarships to students who have taken online and blended classes. We give grants to teachers who are innovating in their classrooms, and we publish research insights, all centered around transformation, transformation of the teaching and learning process. And we've done a lot of amazing work over the years. And essentially, we have proof of concept. We have stories and testimonials and anecdotes from educators and learners across the country around the benefits and advantages of blended and online learning. And so blended online learning is not something that started happening in the spring of 2020, but it's been around for a very long time. And as a high school graduate in the year 1999, I actually took an online class way back then and thought, why haven't all my classes been this way? I got through it faster. I learned more and I was able to, for the things I didn't care about, I was able to move quickly through that and not be bogged down 
because the teacher happened to care more about that than other things. Such a great, that's such a great personal story, Jethro. And it's one that we don't hear enough of. There's a, a misnomer right now that online learning is what was, has been occurring since the, since COVID-19 in March. When we, you know, and I know, and a, and a small group of others know that the first online program emerged in 1995, which consequently is when I graduated from high school. So <laughs> not to date myself, but that's 25 years to be able to introduce it, to be able to enhance it, to be able to ebb and flow with the times. But like I say in, in many of, the, of my comments and remarks, Online and blended learning isn't new to America. It's just new to most Americans because what I found, and I'm, you know, I was classically trained as a, you know, teacher in the classroom and also online until a parent has a child who struggles in school. That's one, the major category. You don't seek out a different way, a different schooling option until your child is struggling or you have a major life event. There's a there's a terminal illness or a move or, uh, you know, a military change for a family. So until you have something, uh, what I call a small C crisis, a personal crisis that causes you to rethink where your child goes to school, it's, it's easy to assume that this is working for my child. This is, you know, the local school, this is working for them. Or if it's not, we'll come up with our own reasons and rationalizations that as to why leaving them in their local school is better than changing schools. So now because of COVID-19, it's as if our collective eyes as a society have been open to wait a minute to a lot of things, right? To how much schools do to provide for kids, to the critical role that a teacher has and and how much the, how important the teacher student relationship is. And some of the pieces we talk about as a forward thinking organization at future of school Online learning is not new to America. It's just new to most Americans. Yeah. And and I think that that perspective of knowing that it's been around for a while, that people have done it and done it successfully um, and use that as a way to to school their children has is a really valuable insight that, like you said, most people don't know about. You know, for me personally, my oldest daughter has Down syndrome. And once she was born, I knew that things were going to be different for our family than what we had expected, you know. And I've learned that um, a lot of the things that we do for my daughter with Down syndrome are actually really beneficial to my other kids as well, like giving clear, direct feedback and saying, that's not a good choice. Here's how you can do better. Like, I didn't ever think about that with normal kids, quote unquote, (laughs) because they they just figure that stuff out. But you have to be really explicit in some things with my oldest daughter, and that's helped us do that with other kids. And I think the same can be said for this online and blended learning that, you know, it, it can actually be better in a lot of ways, but it hasn't been. Why hasn't it been better in the spring of 2020 and the beginning of the school year of 2020 also? Yeah, that's a, another fantastic hour or two long conversation that I'm going to try to synthesize down. First and foremost, our our K-12 education system as a whole, it has existed one way. It has existed as a one size fits all. I'm the teacher. I'm going to impart this information on you. And you're going to either memorize it, learn it, somehow synthesize it. And then you're going to demonstrate that you know it. And this is going to be measured by, you know, standardized testing or some type of infrastructure of assessment. So the system has been like that since the 1600s, since we had our first one room schoolhouse. In the last, say, 50 years, our society has evolved and changed so much. And every other every other vertical of society has evolved with it. Healthcare, a merchandise, shopping, except for K-12 education. And it's there's a lot of reasons why it hasn't changed, but I think the primary reason is because there hasn't been a we haven't reached a tipping point where people see that it's had need it needs to change, right? And I don't mean that all students and teachers should be learning online. By no means is that the change that we need, but we need our classrooms to reflect what kids should be able to learn to prepare them for the future that give them the skills that they need that will make them successful when they enter into the workforce. We also are overcoming this misperception that a four-year degree is the ticket to success. 40 years ago, that was different. We lived in very much a a different type of industrial manufacturing-based society. Now we don't. So we've had all this social, financial, 
evolution in our country, technological, and it hasn't impacted our schools. And I think there's been a lot of, there has been a lot of it, you know, if it isn't, if it ain't broke, why are we going to fix it? But what needs to be fixed? It's not that you, you start from scratch. It's you take that foundation and bring it up to speed. The K-12 education system has served very well for hundreds of years. And, but it's been, there's been some begging for change over the last 20 to 30 years, I'd say. And I think specific to your question about why, why was it so hard and challenging this spring is because we saw that schools weren't ready to pivot on a dime. They weren't designed and set up to be able to transition to any environment. Education, teaching and learning happened in the building. School was synonymous with the school as a noun. And COVID-19 taught us school is a verb. And I'm sure that the English teachers out there are, I'm going to get a few emails from the English teachers <laughs> right now, but school can happen, learning happens anywhere, anytime. And to the, I, I give so much credit to teachers because teachers in study after study, and I, you know, I'll give you the, the stats to share with your audience on this. Teachers want to be able to use technology in smart, effective ways to make their jobs easier and to connect with kids differently but it's a very small percentage of teachers that have been trained to do so. Now, this was before COVID, and then the second survey came out after COVID. So they wanted it before, they want it now. And it's time for us as a collective entity to respond back to say, teachers, we know you wanted it then, and we know you want it now. So we're going to do better and listen to you and your creative ingenuity for how you can use these tools to help support learning anywhere, anytime for kids. Yeah, and I think that's the really important piece is that teachers, no teacher is out there saying, oh, I just wish that, you know, kids could just come in my classroom and I could just lecture at them all day long and then send them out. And teachers go into it because they love kids, they support them, they want to help them be the best that they can be. But then this whole idea of training comes in and it it requires you to teach in a different way than you have been teaching. And so I spent this summer really working with principals trying to help them see the value in doing things asynchronously, not knowing what the fall was going to hold, but being prepared that if you start asynchronously, then with your planning at least, then you can make it work whether you're in person or whether you're not in person. And that was a really hard barrier to overcome because as you said, everybody thought that school was this one thing, that it was a schoolhouse and that's where we met and that's where we did everything. But we had to start shifting that and seeing that that learning could happen anywhere. And I think what's important for us to to recognize is that the learning really can happen anywhere and that we don't even have to be in charge of it all. And so how do you help teachers and principals recognize that we don't have to be in charge of learning like we have been in the past and that we can accept different opportunities for learning besides just, you know, the teacher says this, they give an assessment and then they see how kids are doing. Yeah. There's a couple of points I want to touch on with that because I am very lucky and fortunate in my job at Future of School to be able to provide opportunities for that for teachers across America. And that's through our teacher grant program. We give teachers who have an entrepreneurial spirit who say, if I had this, this amount of money, it's interesting. You'd be very surprised probably to know that it's not a lot of money. Our, you know, the grants that we give are up to $10,000. And I remember the first year um, we got a grant application for $1,650. And I called the teacher and I said, I, you know, we have received your application. I want to verify, did you leave a zero off? And she said, no, I didn't. And I said, are you sure you don't need anything else? Because we were going to ultimately, she had a strong application. So we were going to give her a grant. But I wanted to make sure she took advantage of this opportunity to get what she needed. She only needed $1,650 worth of technology. So that, you know, a little bit of an aside there, we provide financial support for the technology and to be able to have those teachers supported in their blended learning programs that they want to roll out. And in addition to that, we have, they're in a year long cohort. So they meet monthly. And that gives them an opportunity to connect with each other. Even though all of their programs are very, very different, they learn and they're able to troubleshoot and share thoughts with each other. So a, a large part of my job is to be able to provide opportunities for teachers. Like I said, we've been doing it for five years. So those are the teachers who are on the, we'll call it the, the leading edge in their mind. They, they're not in the school that has 
the resources or the prioritization of the resources, because otherwise they would have that. See, helping to support them individually and collectively is a great reward. That being said, there's the other flip side of that that makes it very challenging for teachers and administrators to do that is a fixed mindset. So I share that because every year for the last five years, I, this is the first year that we haven't had that. When the, school, when the district or the school receives a check, there's at least one person, one educator, whether it's a counselor or an instructional technologist, doesn't matter what their role is, where the school or the district does, hasn't cashed the check. I, I have to force that, that piece of it. And it's not, it's, not out of, it's not out of bad intentions. And I'm a glasses overflowing kind of gal. So <laughs> maybe, maybe there are bad intentions, but I like to believe it's, it's fear. It's you are the only one that wants to do this in the school. We didn't give you any money. You figured out funding at every single point. The administrator has, they, they've cashed the check and the educator has been able to roll it out. And there's never been a point of contention after that. But there was that point of tension where it was me, you know, and we had to work to educate them that, look, we're not coming in to take over. We're not coming in to change it. We're just trying to get your teacher what they need. And trust me when I tell you, you're going to be amazed. And every year they're amazed. So it, it goes now with COVID-19, it goes in all angles. It's maybe the school and the administrator has the growth mindset, but maybe the parent population has fear, or maybe everybody in the community is open and ready for that transformation. But maybe they're the people that make the decisions, the policy makers say, no, that's not going to happen because of, you know, hesitation or funding models or, you know, the laundry list of why, you know, why change doesn't happen. So I've, I've seen it on both ends and I've also seen people meet in the middle. And I think that's to me, one of the most beautiful things is to see people evolve in their thinking, even if they're not sold on it initially and to just see them when they realize, okay, this is what's in kids' best interest. This is the direction we're moving. I may not fully get it because what I, the one comment I've heard over and over when, it, when we talk about resistance to change and resistance to transformation is this. Starts with this. Well, when I was in school, well, we didn't need computers when I was in school. We didn't have those dang cell phones when I was young. Well, I had to walk uphill both ways and borrow my brother's shoes. And, and so I recognize and honor the fact that education is such a personal thing for people and they relate it to their own experiences. So I have, a, I have a lot of grace and a lot of understanding for it. And I think that's something that is the critical foundation for us moving forward as a society in, in the evolution of schools, in the future of school. John Cat Educational supports high quality teaching and learning by providing publications that are research based, practical, and focused on the key topics proven essential in today's and tomorrow's schools. The latest John Cat publications include a book whose bold, transformative ideas amaze and infuriate people around the world, according to one reviewer, a title from Global Leaders in Curriculum Planning, Practice, and Retrieval, one book that says Stop Talking and Start Doing with regard to teacher well being, and much more. These books, used by educators of all roles across North America and worldwide, amplify fresh, engaging voices with practical strategies to create transformative change. Learn more in our show notes at jethrojones.com slash podcast. During COVID, every teacher is a new teacher. That's why innovative school leaders are turning to TeachFX, whose professional learning platform doubles student engagement online or in person. To learn more about TeachFX and get a special offer, visit teachfx.com slash transformative principle. Yeah, you know, that idea about personalizing education, not just for the students, which is kind of a buzzword, personalized learning, but really recognizing that it is so personal for the adults too, that it, if you say we can't do education this way anymore because it's not good for kids, they immediately say, well, it was good enough for me and I turned out okay. And, and then it becomes like this personal, like deep seated issue that is really, really hard to overcome. Yeah. I, I, like I said, 
the story that follows it is always different, but the beginning of, well, when I was in school uh, over and over and over. And I think that's where, you know, when we look at policies and I'm saying just not, you know, not politics, but just policies that exist in education. One of the things that amazed me about COVID-19, which I was really happy for because it was a very quick response, whatever it takes, whatever it takes to support students, whatever it takes to create a learning environment in everyone's homes, we, it is an all hands on deck. Because the reality is people could have said, well, we're just going to shut schools down for the rest of the year. But they didn't. They knew how important that was. But to watch the levers of policy be switched on or off or put on hold or tabled or waived within a matter, in some states, hours, hours. It was like, oh, okay, this is the health and wellness of people in our state. You know what's not so important is seat time. We can we can just put a hold on that, like or state testing. Well, we'll just put a pause on that. We'll revisit that because health and safety and wellness. And it brings tears to my eyes because that's not a perspective as a like in our country. I don't think we've ever been in that kind of situation or perspective before as it relates to sweeping quick change that has major implications. And so I, I feel like going back to the, when I was in school, that we're going to see decision makers and policymakers moving forward, step away from that a little bit now that everyone's eyes have been open to what the challenges are at hand, but then also what the opportunities are. Yeah, that that is absolutely correct. And And I've seen so many people step up to the plate with that and say, this is no longer important, but this stuff over here is. And talking about the social emotional wellness of students. And as I mentioned before, I, I spent the summer working with principals to make reopening plans. And when I when we got down to what really mattered, what what they could articulate mattered the most, it always came down to something about the kids feeling and knowing that they mattered, that they were loved, and putting their needs above anything else. So when I said what are the most the three most important things in your school, nobody, and I promise you nobody said academics was number one. They talked about all the other things that are important, all the other things that schools do. Those were what we really needed to focus on. And to see that change was was amazing because we certainly haven't acted like that was most important in the past. Yeah, no, I know. I wholly and completely agree with you. It was super interested in society and social influences and drivers. And it's been very helpful for me to have that be a passion pursuit on the side because it it's helped me see the, our education system from a different perspective and why, why there hasn't, you know, why we've been slow to change, why there's resistance and the relationship piece is so critical. But the other piece I, that, that we as a society, you know, are just now being thrust into is challenges and difficult times can make us stronger. Challenge and difficult times can make us better because, you know, in the world that we live in today, it's, okay, I'm going to avoid this. I don't know. It's too big to change or, Oh, I don't even know how I'm going to do it. So I'm going to steer clear of that. Uh, um, oh gosh, like there's a big obstacle in the way. Should I go around it or under it? And it's step up to it, you know, and try to move forward when you understand what it is. And so I think that's a, the other piece that now, you know, educators, they know that, you know, I, I've never heard someone say I went into education for the paycheck, or I, I've, st- I've never heard someone, I, I have not heard somebody say, I go into, I've gone into education. I want to be a teacher for the summers off. Maybe, maybe somebody has that mindset, which is fine anyways, but there it's grading papers at night. It's PD in the summer. It's conferences when you can fit them in. And it really is, uh, it's a challenging job, but you do it because you have that heart for kids and because you want to make a difference on kids' lives. And I think one of the silver linings of the pandemic was the role of the teacher was elevated to, for, for everyone to see on center stage as I, you know, and I consider teachers now to be first responders and I consider them to some degree to be, you know, first and second responders in the spring. Right. But they're, they're showing up, they're doing what needs to be done in some cases in person this fall. And they are doing it because they want to be with their students and because they want to build those relationships. And I hope that continues. I hope the respect and value that we saw for educators this spring, I hope that continues and, and, and Bill is built upon moving forward because I, I, ju- I just think that it, it was easy to default to 
the schools got it, the, you know, they're good. The teachers, you know, they got it covered. And now we know and see how much schools and educators do and have done to support students emotionally, socially, academically. Yeah. And it, and it is so much more than just what's happening inside the classroom, the things they're doing, but the, the sacrifices they're making, what they're doing to, to make sure they are taking kids and taking care of kids in those different areas. And I, what I hope to see is, is teachers taking this opportunity to realize that if it was so quick to make those big, big policy changes that you mentioned before, like no more state testing and seat time not being as necessary and to really focus on the kids themselves and their own learning path. I hope to see more of that going forward. And one thing that I've, I've said numerous times when people bring up things like, you know, kids falling behind and things like that. The, the only way that a kid is behind is when you're comparing them to somebody else. If they are compared to just themselves, they're always growing and always learning. And nowhere has that been more apparent than in my own daughter's life, where she she learns way slower than everybody else. And she's way behind where where she should be. But what I see is her growing and getting better each and every single day. And that's what kids naturally do. That's what they love to do. That's what invigorates them and makes them feel like they have worth and value is they are continuing to grow. And I hope that we can stop some of this comparing and do more of this students going at their own pace, learning as best they can. And what I've actually seen with that is when we give them the opportunity, they actually exceed our expectations and learn more than the standards that we're trying to teach them in the first place. Absolutely. And I'm with you on all of those points. There's lots of buzzwords out there. So that, you know, the one that I'm about to say, <laughs> I'll preface that I know it's a buzz phrase, but student centered learning, that's what it's about. It's putting the student at the center. And when we compare putting the student at the center right now versus student centered learning a year ago, it was, it's different. It, it, I wholly believe that it's very, very different. If a year ago we were having this conversation and we were talking about student centered learning, I, I believed in it. And I think that certain schools and, you know, instructors were doing it and teachers were doing it within certain classrooms. But now when we had, a, we had this in mass students first mentality in the spring, and it, it's, it's hard to unsee that even through the growing pains of shifting over to effective remote instruction. So, you know, I, we coined this term or heard it somewhere and borrowed it, called crisis schooling. We said what happened this past spring due to COVID-19 was crisis schooling. It was emergency instruction at best. And that was in March. And then when we got to May and June, what we saw was a, a shift to remote teaching and learning, which has more intentionality to that phrase. And as an organization, what Future of School, what we're supporting now is ways in which districts and schools can move to effective remote instruction. And they're having to make plans that can change within hours, right? So anyone who says that they have it figured out for this year, I, I would pause and be super cautious about that because it's ever changing. What we hear and what we see is ever changing. And, and I believe that is to motivate us to continue along the pathways of valuing the individuality of students to leverage the ways that we know that they learn best. And, and I heard from many families that never had considered doing something, you know, that was distance education based for their child, that their, for their child, it actually, it was a better fit for what they needed. They just had not considered it before. Yeah, exactly. So last year in the spring, I was the principal of a homeschool program in Alaska. And so Alaska is a little bit different with their homeschool. They go through the schools and you have support and things like that. And it was great because I saw this totally different side of what school could be. But then what I also saw was that people, once the shutdown happened, people who had never thought about doing that before suddenly thought, you know what, maybe I could do this. And I talked to one mom, and I'll never forget what she said, because it was so poignant. She said, when my kids are at school, then I'm totally fine with the teacher being in charge and having control and all that kind of stuff. But now that my kids are home, like I want to be more involved in their education because they're sitting right in front of me. So I'm not satisfied with them just doing the same work that everybody else is doing when I know that they're at different levels than their peers. I want their work to be customized for them. And so now this mom is uh, is doing homeschool, even though that was something that was never 
even remotely possible for her. And now she's like totally into it because she had this different experience and said, you know, I don't think that that's the best situation for my family. So we're going to do homeschool. And to be honest, my wife is one of those as well, who has said for years, we're never doing homeschool because you're in public education. I'm just sending kids to your school. And now she's saying, you know what? This could actually be better for our family because it could fit our lifestyle better. And amazing that there are those opportunities that that just were not there before because we just were so used to the status quo and continuing it. Yeah. Yeah. And I give you a lot of credit for recognizing that. First of all, rec- both of you recognizing that and owning that, oh, huh, we, maybe we should pivot. And then also for sharing that, because it's, it's easy to think that school leaders have it all figured out. And, oh, you know, just like anything, if you're a, if you're a surgeon, then you can do surgery on anyone or, you know, it's that you're, it's your expertise. And, you know, I, I've, my entire career has been dedicated to education and I've had different roles and worked in different areas. Um, But when my son was in the second grade and his teacher called me and said, yeah, you know, he's lazy. He's not trying hard enough. You know, he's volitionally unwilling to write. I was like, I don't know that, you know, I was like, that, that sounds weird. He's only seven and he loves school. So this is, this is really interesting for me. And I had to listen to that response, that voice inside of me that said, just, just get it checked out. And I remember, you know, so I took him to a neuropsychologist and he was diagnosed with dysgraphia, which is, you know, dysgraphia is to writing what dyslexia is to reading, you know, to give some context for listeners. But my point is, it was interesting afterwards when I would, you know, share it with family and friends, because I feel like information is power, right? And you can share one nugget nugget with somebody and that can be transformative. That can change their perspective. So I would share it with them and and what they said to me was not transformative, which was, well, Amy, you work in education. You've got this. And I'm like, I know nothing about specific learning disabilities. I know nothing about, really, I don't know much about 504s. When I taught in the classroom, I taught I taught Spanish. And when you teach a modern language, typically that's not the class that students who have a learning disability take. It's not that I didn't have them, but it wasn't a, a core class that they had to take. And so it was just so funny. People would be like, oh, you know, you've got all this education figured out. And I, I mean, I read books and I wrote letters to the district and I, I became this fervent advocate for him because... I wanted to do what was in his best interest, but at the same time, I partnered with the school, even if it was a difficult conversation. I never went in with a torch, you know, like, okay, well, who who do I need to talk to now? I went in with, you know, muffins and coffee, even if I had to bring the district. It's like, I want to help you, but this is new territory for all of us. So I'm an early adopter to change (laughs) and I support it because um, I've seen what happens when, when, when it's, we're talking about, you know, we're not talking about terrible decisions we're making. We're saying, for example, do you want your child to go full-time online or do you want them to go full-time in person? What's the best choice for your family? And, I, and I've seen a lot of people in different roles stress about, I, I, don't, I don't know. I don't know what's best for my child. I don't know what's best for my niece. I don't know what I should do. You know, And I give them a lot of credit because they're stopping to think about it and really put thoughtful intention into the next step for them. Yeah. And that's different than what it's been because for so long, it's just been here, just go down this path and do the same thing that we've always done that everybody does. And I think right now more than ever, it's important for us to be able to have that conversation about what is best for each individual family. So I'm sure we could continue talking about this. There's a ton of data that I put in the show notes at jethrojones.com slash podcast slash episode 356. So you can get all that there. Um, Lots of good information there. Uh, But the last question I want to ask you, Amy, is what is one thing that a principal can do this week to be a transformative leader like you? The one piece of advice that I would give to a principal that they can implement this week is to bring their staff together, to bring your staff, to bring your parents, to bring your students together, whatever that looks like for you. Every school is different. Every community is different. But if you can integrate one or two different ways of communicating with them, whether it's a town hall online for parents, professional Zoom happy hour for your staff, and or, you know, a scavenger hunt or show and tell of whatever it is for your community for kids, stay connected, especially, I almost said even if, but especially if you're not sure what your reopening plans are. And I just read the other day that over 50% of schools haven't committed to what their reopening plans are. 
it, that's okay. It's okay to say, we're not sure, we're figuring it out. But the piece that's critical is to stay connected with families so that that sense of community as a school is reinforced in these times of unknown and, and waters that are, that are quickly moving. Yeah, I think that that is great advice. And again, thank you so much. People can connect with Future of School at futureof.school. And then they can follow you on Twitter at Amy Valentine 555, right? Yep. Okay, well, thank you so much again, Amy, for being part of Transformative Principle. Got it. Thank you to our valued partner, John Cat Educational. If you are a leader looking to make transformative change by providing yourself and your leaders and teachers with professional development that is research-based and rigorous, yet easy to digest and full of practical strategies, check out the latest publications from John Cat. Visit us.johncatbookshop.com to find information on bulk orders or learn much more in our show notes. You can also use the code TRANSFORMATIVE to save a bundle at us.johncatbookshop.com. School principals across the country are using TeachFX's virtual PD and job-embedded feedback to boost student engagement during COVID. With TeachFX, teachers get eight times more feedback and generate 144% more student engagement on average in a school year with no additional work for school leaders or teachers. To learn more about TeachFX and get a special offer, visit teachfx.com slash transformative principle.